Tonight's lecture focuses on the centuries that separate Prophet Jesus from Prophet Muhammad. Specifically, we will look at four primary issues, the interpretation of which divides contemporary Christianity from Islam. These four issues are the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion event, the nature of Jesus, and the nature of God. In reviewing these four issues, each issue will be examined in turn and where appropriate will be traced along chronological trajectories. However, before beginning this endeavor, it should be noted that contrary to popular belief, early Christianity was not a single monolithic structure. There were many branches to early Christianity and each local church, for example, the church at Corinth, the church at Jerusalem, was independent of every other church. Each church had its own ecclesiastical hierarchy and its own set of recognized scripture. Thus the letter of Barnabas was recognized as scripture by the church at Alexandria, Egypt, but not by other churches. Some churches recognized the Gospel of Thomas and the Shepherd of Hermas, and other churches did not. In that regard, it should be noted that most of the apocryphal books that I'll be referencing later in the lecture were recognized as authoritative by one or another of the early Christian churches. And in fact, it was not until the sixth century that the books of the New Testament became almost completely standardized, although attempts at standardization had begun about two centuries before that, and although the East Syrian or Nestorian Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and the Coptic Church to this day have different New Testaments than the rest of Christianity and from each other. Well, not only did the local churches differ as to what was and was not considered scripture, they also differed as to doctrine and dogma. And such differences were especially apparent when we consider the four issues under consideration this evening. Now it's quite outside of current time parameters to cover all of the different positions advanced by one or another early branch of Christianity with regard to each of these four issues. Quite simply, it is not the intent of tonight's lecture to present the full range of opinion that existed within early Christianity, but only to highlight those early branches of Christianity that were more or less consistent with Islam's position on the four issues under consideration. Quran 3 verse 49 informs the reader that Jesus was appointed by God as a messenger to the children of Israel. In contrast, contemporary Christianity typically maintains that Jesus' mission and ministry were to the world at large. Nonetheless, there are several New Testament passages that appear to agree with the Islamic position that he was sent only to the children of Israel. For example, consider the following biblical verses. These twelve, that is the twelve disciples, these twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, verses 5 through 6. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. 
Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus reportedly said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, we might also consider how the actual disciples of Jesus, as well as their immediate followers, continued Jesus' ministry after the end of his earthly sojourn. However, at this point, we must interject a very important proviso that is often overlooked, even though known, by most contemporary Christians. Namely, that Paul, a former Pharisee and rabbi, once known as Saul of Tarsus, was never a disciple of Jesus, and apparently never even met Jesus during the latter's earthly ministry. In short, Paul, who was the foremost proponent of this concept of a universal ministry for Jesus, does not represent the tradition of the disciples of Jesus, and in fact was frequently in marked conflict with the Jerusalem church, which was the headquarters of the disciples of Jesus. And this can be readily substantiated by turning to the New Testament. When he, that is Paul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Other New Testament passages, for example, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26, and Galatians 2, verses 1 through 9, dramatically illustrate that Paul, with his insistence on preaching to the Gentiles, was in frequent conflict with the Jerusalem church. Now with regard to these three passages, it's instructive to note that Acts and Galatians are Pauline documents and do not reflect the teachings of the Jerusalem church and of the actual disciples of Jesus. As an illustration of this Pauline bias, one can profitably examine Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26, where the Pauline writer of this text attempts to show that the Jerusalem church supported Paul in the end. However, the fact of the matter was, as recorded in that very passage, the elders of the Jerusalem church made Paul undergo the temporary rites of being a Nazarite, meaning that he was made to purify himself and to pay penance for what he had been doing. Well, despite this Pauline bias, Acts does preserve a statement indicating what the actual disciples of Jesus and their immediate followers did when it came to preaching the message of Jesus. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And they spoke the word to no one except Jews. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. In short, any serious student of early Christianity must recognize a fundamental divergence of thought between the Pauline church with its message to the Gentiles and the Jerusalem church of Jesus' actual disciples. The latter restricted its message to the children of Israel, continued to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and did not even call themselves Christians, a term that first arose in the Gentile church in Antioch, as witnessed by Acts chapter 11, verses 20 through 26. Now, many scholars of early Christianity, recognizing that the actual disciples of Jesus did not preach to other than the children of Israel, refer to the Jerusalem church as being Jewish Christian. This Jewish Christian tradition continued even after the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Such early Christian movements as the Ibionites, 
the Nazarenes, 